It is my great pleasure, and we are so thrilled to be able to announce Dr. Deborah Giles, Yay. known as Giles. Hey, thanks, Giles is amazingly accomplished and experienced. PhD in conservation biology from UC Davis and a very experienced and accomplished poop picker upper from <laughs> the uh, SCAT studies using Tucker, the poop sniffing dog, uh, out in Harrow Strait to get all sorts of great information from those samples. And Giles is here as representative of the Center for Whale Research, which is a recent development that we are so thrilled about. So, um, I give you Giles. Thank you. Woo. I caught him. <laughs> okay, this is kind of my first uh, first official uh, presentation on uh, center data. So I'm a little nervous, even though I've been lecturing on my own research for 11 years. Um, and I'm just gonna take your picture for our website. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, as Howie said, Howard said, um, I'm with the Center for Well Research now. I was hired um, at the beginning of November. Um, I've been telling people when they say, oh, how's it going? I say, I feel like I'm living a dream. And I really do feel like I'm living my dream. I'm um, so thrilled to be a part of the, this long, long-term organization and um, to be able to make some collaborative, uh, new collaborative projects in addition to some of the older collaborative projects that have been going on for a long time. So, um, Okay, so I just wanted to take a, a step back. I know everybody knows the history of the center um, and kind of how uh, Ken got involved, Ken Balcom got involved with the, with the Southern residents, but um, <clears throat> some of these pictures aren't as well uh, known as I, I think that they should be. And um, hope, uh, I hope to have some sort of archival area on our website at some point to be able to pick up uh, and show some of these old photos. So this, uh, a couple of slides I actually got from Dr. John Ford from uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Uh, we've been uh, talking with him quite a bit uh, well, through the last 40 years, but more recently about um, trying to do some more collaborative work uh, across the border. So, of course, we see Vancouver Island from uh, San Juan Island, but um, for a lot of years, there's, there's been kind of like the Canadians doing research and the U.S. folks doing research. And so now we're really starting to talk about doing some more collaborative things, which I'm really excited about. So uh, there will be a number of slides in my presentation that came right from John, and I thank him very much for providing those. So uh, these uh, pictures kind of go back and show you the kind of the history of, of uh, the situation up in the uh, Puget Sound area. Um, with these whales being um, hunted, uh, shot at for practice, um, and then uh, selectively removed for the um, captive industry. And uh, um, just some pretty horrific photos there, but it really kind of sets the stage for why it was important for research to begin and, and uh, um, continue on this population. So uh, these studies started with Mike Big, um, a Canadian, uh, actually a, a Brit comes to find out, but uh, uh, grew up on, um, on Vancouver Island. He piloted this, the use of uh, photo identification for picking out individuals and being able to track the life history of individuals. Um, uh, I wish I had had a chance to meet him um, by all accounts. He was an, an amazing mentor, amazing friend, father, um, and he really, he, he really provided a solid foundation for work that would continue on uh, with multiple different generations now to, uh, into the third generation of people um, studying different populations of cetaceans around the world using the um, techniques that he came up with. 
So um, Ken Balcom was hired by the um, U.S. Uh, government to uh, get a handle on what was happening with the southern residents. Um, that's actually a newer picture of, of Ken. The one below is of uh, Graham Allison, John Ford, and Mike Big. Um, those two gentlemen were um, uh, also hired, but by the um, Canadian government to get a handle on the northern residents. And uh, they did take information and continue to take information on southern residents as well. But generally, they're kind of focused on transients in the area and, and northern residents. So just some fun old pictures of uh, when Ken first started out. Um, funky old research boat. Um, nice group of southern residents there. There's a very famous picture right now that Candace Ammons from NOAA took that is of, uh, I think it's K21, um, one of our current wells in front of the uh, Seattle skyline. And I found this on the computer at the center last night. Uh, the um, skyline in Seattle looks quite a bit different and, um, back then. So this is 1977. It's um, J3 was the animal. <clears throat> Another nice photo of a uh, superpod that was occurring in 1978 and Ken's research vessel at the time. So my talk, um, this, as I said earlier, this, this kind of, this talk is about research that's been going on for, for the 40 years and then hinting at some research that's um, coming down the pipeline. And then uh, towards the end, a real pitch to you guys, hopefully, to become um, engaged uh, in uh, the sightings network. Uh, it's almost like uh, John Kalamakitis and uh, Juliana Houghton. Um, it's like we planned it, uh, our talks. Uh, we didn't, uh, I didn't know what they were going to be talking about specifically, but um, both of our uh, former speakers were talking about the importance of, of sightings and uh, citizen sciences, uh, scientists providing information to these sightings networks. And you can see from the amazing research that, um, that was presented today and then multiple other studies that have been uh, that have come out of sightings networks um, it's really um, such a, a potential rich database uh, to pull from as a, as a researcher and so towards the end of my talk I'd like to make a pitch to you for um, how uh, myself the Center for Whale Research uh, Howie and Susan from Orca Network the Whale Museum um, and hopefully Cascadia I haven't run this by John yet but hopefully <laughs> They're going to be uh, interested in this too, but really just making it a more robust, fine scale, finer detail um, data set. So uh, Orca survey was uh, was what we it is what we call the main study that Ken has been engaged in since 1976, and essentially it's uh, trying to document every whale born and every whale um, that dies in the southern resident community, and you can tell by this graph that there's been some pretty major fluctuations um, in kind of a downward trend. Uh, there's the nice upward trend after the uh, captures ended, but um, generally speaking, um, from the peak in 19 1995, um, the, the population um, ha has been declining overall. And so um, there's this research that kind of sets the stage for that and documents that, that trend. Um, and then these information can be used uh, as the foundation for so many other types of research that has come, come beyond. So this is a very classic um, Center for Well Research graph. Uh, you'll see this in a lot of publications. Uh, and we try and keep this up to date as, as um, you know, as things change right away. You're, you will notice here that, uh, so 2015, we know we ended 2015 with seven, uh, 84 animals. Um, the Center for Well Research always gives the end date for the census for that year on July 1st, and that's just because that's how it was set up in 1976. We do have other areas on our website that uh, have different graphs that I'll show you in a second where if you, if you want to know specifically how many whales in each pod, um, sorry, my forward button is dodgy. Um, okay, so this is, um, this is, these are graphs put together by uh, um, a collaborator, Jane Kogan. 
Uh, she's been working with the Center for Well Research for about two years now, and she's an ex-Boeing employee. Um, she has a brain for numbers and graphs and uh, figures, and she's been putting together some really, really fantastic um, kind of uh, report summaries about, about the long-term data. Um, this one's really nice. It shows you uh, uh, the nice, uh, in the blue down below, the nice increase in J-pod. Um, sadly, the flat line of K-pod. We haven't had a K-pod animal since 2011, somebody? 2011, 2012. Um, uh, L-pod also declining. Um, and then the kind of the nice tick up uh, towards the latter part of 2015 with the increase in the, these, uh, this so-called baby boom. So this is a really um, interesting graph that Jane put together and it combines in one graph the coastwide abundance of Chinook salmon and the deaths of the southern resident killer whales. And so you can really see this tight uh, correlation between uh, the population, the southern resident population, and how much fish they have to, to, you know, how much fish is out there for them to be able to find. Um, so uh, um, Jim Waddell was up here earlier talking to you about the um, desperate need to uh, really contact the White House, contact your state uh, and local representatives, and, and ask them to get behind um, so, uh, an effort to breach dams on the lower Four Snake River. Uh, the four dams on the Lower Snake River. Um, the, that's that's an effort that the center is very um, passionate about. We feel like it's the best bet that the whales have um, to increase their food abundance really quickly, and that's something that you guys can all help participate in. Um, this graph really highlights the need for that, ex that for that fish. Um, uh, I could go on literally for an hour or more talking about just this one subject. If you want to talk uh, more, let's have a beer at the. Whidbey Hotel. <laughs> so um, I wanted to fill you in on some really exciting information um, that just happened last week. I was flown out to Exeter, England. It was a fantastic week, brilliant uh, time I had. Uh, the, the gentleman all the way uh, on your left, uh, Darren Croft, he's a professor at Exeter and he uh, has a team of people that have been working on the centers uh, the center's 40-year-long data set and also a data set from John Ford from uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And they, he's had two grad students, two PhD students that have gone through his lab that have done some really phenomenal work looking at the old data that the center has collected over time and, and DFO has collected over time. So I just was going to run through a couple of those and then uh, hint about something that's hopefully coming down the pipeline in the next, for the next four years. So the Southern Residence, any resident community offers, offers a really unique um, uh, group of, of uh, individual animals to study, to ask some really um, fairly basic questions to test uh, current theories that we have about social networking, um, um, ask questions about um, uh, menopause. One of the first, uh, um, actually it was the second paper that came out, the first paper that came out was Emma Foster's paper, and her paper uh, looked at the social dynamics within the Southern Residence, and she was really able to show that um, males do preferentially hang out with their mothers. They, um, uh, you know, it was kind of termed that these mama's boys, um, they, they really do survive better when their mothers survive longer. So older females have uh, older uh, children that last longer. So um, very interesting study. Again, um, I have a copy of it. If you want to talk about it, we can later. Um, the next one that came out was, um, uh, this is actually some of uh, Darren Croft's work uh, looking at menopause in different populations of mammals. And it's a unique situation where you have uh, short, short fin pilot whales and killer whales mimicking uh, or paralleling, I should say, uh, human populations where you have females that have up to 30 plus years of, of life after they give birth to their last calf um, from kind of a functional biological evolutionary standpoint, that's, that's kind of an oddity where, um, for example, elephants can have, they can have incredibly long lives, 270, 80 years old, but they tend to have, uh, they can have calves up until quite close to when they, when they die. So the question is, why, why menopause? Why, why in, um, why, why do we have that? And so, um, 
Oh, and this was out of order. This was the one about social networks and the um, boys hanging out with moms more than uh, adult females uh, hanging out with mom. Sorry about that. So one of the ways that, uh, um, you know, kind of asking these questions about why would you have uh, this, this situation where you have females living long past when they're reproductively um, um, adding to the population. And so it kind of begs the question, you know, what's the purpose? Why are they, why, why does that happen? Um, one of the ways to try and get at those answers is to say, you know, how, how are the females um, uh, behaving in the in the community and uh, Lauren Brent, uh, Brent who was uh, Darren Croft's second grad student chose to look at um, how how the social movement of groups um, uh, kind of statistically laid down um, ultimately what she did find is that adult females lead more than males um, and older females lead groups uh, more than younger younger females um, Further, she ended up showing that in years of low salmon abundance, uh, the older females statistically did lead the groups uh, more than any of, of the other um, kind of age class or um, sexual uh, reproduction class, which is interesting. So essentially, in other words, the older females know where to go when there's not a lot of food readily abundant in the environment. The older females, uh, this study is, show, is suggesting that the females know where to go to find the food. They might have a kind of a um, repository of information in the back of their head to say, okay, well, there's not fish there, so we're going to go to the next spot and then the next spot after that. So kind of the conclusions from the Exeter studies, uh, obviously killer whales provide a unique opportunity to test general theories of evolution. Um, they, they've got interesting demography and kins kinship dynamics, um, which kind of probably have predisposed them to the evolution of menopause. Post-reproductive females provide significant uh, survival benefits for offspring. This goes back to Emma Foster's work. Sons benefit more than daughters from post-reproductive females. There's a very interesting paper that Lauren put, uh, Lauren put out, um, I'd love to talk about over a bear, um, about uh, just why that might be. Why, why do mothers preferentially, um, uh, how is it that mothers benefit their sons more than daughters? Um, and that's what I was saying before, uh, post-reproductive females can help by sharing the knowledge um, that they've had over the course of their lifetime. So uh, there are one of the, so I told you I went to England last week and uh, we're in the process of writing a grant uh, that would fund uh, four years of study to test a new theory. Um, I can't go into it too much, um, especially because this is being live streamed, um, but very exciting um, uh, potential for a completely new way of thinking about um, some of the basic questions that we've, that evolutionary biologists have been asking of different animal populations. So on to the sightings thing that I uh, was talking about and the importance of, of citizen science and people making, picking up the phone call and making that phone call when you see an animal. Um, so Orca Network has been around and doing this work for quite a long time. Uh, the Whale Museum has been collecting information uh, for the federal government in a, a, a large database called Orca, um, uh, gosh, sorry, Orca Master. Thanks, Cindy. Um, and other groups have been collecting bits and pieces of information as well. It's all really important um, information, but I think the most important thing to be thinking about is trying to come up with um, a, 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 an easy, uh, fun, uh, educational, if you're a naturalist, how do we collect some of this information and engage your passengers at the same time? Um, and, and really being able to talk about and think about and understand and on a really fundamental level how important this information is. Um, the Cascadia research um, that uh, John presented earlier and Juliana Houghton's work um, gives you a, just a taste of, of the kind of information that we can, that we can utilize from sightings networks. So um, this is just mainly to give credit uh, so far for, for people that are already participating in these projects. But this is some of the information that we can pull out 
of, of the sightings information. So um, this is a very simple kind of summary, uh, summary statistics look at uh, the sightings information. Um, this is 2015 um, for all the different species, and then it shows you which months they were, uh, they were spotted. Um, it seems really simplistic, but if, imagine if we had this information going back to when the change, right when the change happened with, uh, with the humpbacks re, kind of repopulating the, the inland waters. Um, we do have that a little bit, but imagine the amount of information that we could have had given the number of eyes on the water. Um, and so that's what we're hoping to have is a, a situation where we can, like I said, something that's maybe a, an, an, um, an app where you download it onto your, uh, onto your pad. It might even be something that we can get a grant to provide the hardware and the software um, to really start engaging people that, um, that we can train up. We, they know what they're looking for. They know how to, to um, enter the data and send the data in. It doesn't take a long time. You know, we don't want to detract from your own experience or from your passenger's experience. Um, but the, just the, the information is, is um, pr pretty powerful. This is, um, okay, this is an example. Oh boy, it's, is that fuzzy? Sorry about that. This is one day, and this is uh, Jane Kogan taking all of the information that came into all of the different groups and uh, plotting it on a map to show, essentially, there are different groups of, of southern residents here represented. There's a minke whale. There's the, uh, this is a day when the fin whale was in the area, and then there are multiple examples of humpbacks in the water at the, at the same time on one day. So Jane is recreating these maps. Uh, I think she's through March of 2015. Um, the problem, the biggest problem is, is that there's not one place for her to go to find the information to plug in to create these sorts of maps. She's having to do a lot of digging in different sources that comes in in different ways, and it's just a tremendous amount of work. Again, she's retired, but she's doing this for free, amazingly. And some weeks she spends 60 hours a week compiling this information, uh, mainly because she wanted to see, would it be valuable? Uh, she had it in the back of her head that it would be valuable, but until she actually started getting into it and really taking the time to delve into it and create the actual output, um, she didn't know for sure. And so what we're hoping, again, through dialogue that, um, that the Center for Whale Research and um, the Whale Museum and Orca Network have been having, um, we really feel like this is, we're primed to. That there's so many talented, um, capable, able and interested people out there. There's so many eyes on the water that, that now, now we really feel is the time to, to start grasping this. The ability to track what's happening with the southern residents, you know, we can't really be talking about these animals as three pods anymore. We can't even really be talking about them as, as you know, portions of pods. Really, we're going to have to be talking about them as families. Who, which families are hanging out with which families? because that's what we're seeing. We're not seeing JPOD together anymore. And this sort of information, having that fine scale information uh, collected by a lot of people, will be able to, to, to kind of capture that as it's happening. What that tells us or how, we're, you know, how we can utilize that, that's, another, that's a whole other thing, but imagine the, the policy implications for having this kind of information readily available for people that are ready to, to analyze it and put it out. Um, this is uh, just kind of giving you another preview of the kind of information that we can pull. Uh, this is 2015 showing transient wells or Biggs killer wells and humpbacks in the inland waters and uh, the frequency that they were seen uh, in 2015. 
So um, lastly, I wanted to um, just give you a hint. Uh, I threw this in really quickly after Juliana's talk because somebody had asked a question about what, well, what after 2010? Um, as, is anybody analyzing the information with regard to transients in the inland waters after 2010? The answer is yes. Uh, John Ford and his team of people are uh, um, kind of in the midst of finishing a paper uh, that's been looking at the um, uh, the kind of the information 2010 to present and uh, it's going I think it's going to be very interesting to see that come out um, because really the changes you know there's these nice uh, increases in uh, number of days there are these nice increases in um, the average group size of transients it uh, correlates nicely with the prey abundance and all of these changes are significant. You can see the obvious change over time, but from 2010 to 2015, it's going to be even like uh, monumentally m more um, uh, obvious how the change in, in the transient population in the inland waters, uh, um, what that looks like. Uh, Again, this is from um, a, a talk that John gave in 2011 at the Sailor Sea Ecosystem Conference. Um, I think his plan is to, um, well, I don't know if I'm scooping him, never mind. He's going to release that information soon and I think it's going to be really interesting. <laughs> um, this is really fascinating. So this is, um, what this is showing from the 70s through the 2000s, this is showing a shift in resident use versus transient use of the Gulf, Gulf, some of the Gulf Island areas in Canada. Um, so what this is showing, it's, uh, it's just to walk you through it. So uh, uh, in the 70s, the percentage of time that people saw killer whales in the water um, that was the proportion, you know, 100 times to 21 times for, for transients. By the 2000s, it's absolutely flipped. So again, this is a, uh, uh, this is a discrete area in the, Gulf, in the um, uh, uh, central part of the Strait of Georgia and the Canadian Gulf Islands, but uh, it begs the question of whether or not this is ultimately what we'll see throughout the rest of the Salish Sea if things don't change pretty significantly for the southern residents and getting more food, more fish in the water for those whales to find. This kind of goes, uh, this is all kind of obvious, but we're taught that we have to have summary slides in PowerPoints. <laughs> so, um, that's it. Can I answer any questions? Yes. Um, it's a good question, and it's one that I was asking um, Dave and John um, two and three days ago. Um, Oh, sorry. Yeah. So the qu the question is: Is uh, do we have any idea um, um, how many transients regularly occur in the in the inland waters? I don't know. It's uh, I, I, John. Do you know? No. I want to say two sixty to three hundred, um, but don't quote me on that. That's go that is what John's paper is going to be on specifically. That which should be out, uh, there should be some information coming out, um, I'd say in the next six months, maybe even three months. Significantly more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the question is, uh, do the uh, fish eaters and mammal eaters compete in any way? Um, will the increase in uh, transient or mammal eaters uh, impact the fish eaters in any way? Um, 
It's an interesting question. Um, I'm in the process of, uh, of writing a paper. Um, this is another one of the um, really fantastic, I'm really excited about this collaboration. Um, so Center for Well Research, uh, Robin Baird from Cascadia, John Ford from DFO, the Whale Museum, the Stranding Network, um, I'm forgetting somebody, sorry, whoever that is. Um, we're pulling our information on the um, on what I'm terming um, Focina side. So it's uh, Focina, Focina is harbor, uh, harbor porpoise. And uh, southern resident killer whales kill them. They don't eat them, they don't bite them, but they kind of play with them to death. And the, the, you know, that that's a really interesting question to ask why. Why would a fish eater play with a mammal to death? Are they ta you know, testing the waters? Which kind of gets to your question. Um, nobody knows yet. Um, uh, I'm still in the process of, so that I'm going to present this at the Salish Sea Ecosystem Conference in April, um, kind of a, um, a pooling together of all of these individual organizations' data to try and get a handle on this. Um, I, I don't think anybody knows. So far, they're not, they're not, they're not biting them. They don't take a chunk out of them. Um, but that's kind of the one thing that I can think of that's, you know, the one population directly interacting with the prey of the other population or ecotype. Yeah, I don't, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why do we have so many new babies in the southern resident population? Um, best guess is that, relatively speaking, I hate to say that it's good salmon years because we don't have good salmon years anymore, but relatively speaking, say compared to the previous two and a half years when we didn't have any baby killer whale, southern resident killer whale babies that were born that lived, um, the abundance of Chinook, the coastwide abundance of Chinook was higher for 2013, 14, and 15. Uh, what I can tell you is that when those babies were conceived was in uh, the summer, fall of 2013 and uh, winter of 2000, kind of into 2014. Uh, and the southern residents were seen in the inland waters less than half the amount of time than they normally are in that year of 2013. So they were someplace else. Um, not in their inland waters where they normally would have been in the summertime eating on Fraser River Chinook salmon. They were someplace else in conglomerations large enough to have mating going on. And since the mating went on, when the babies were conceived, there was enough food in the, in the environment to sustain the pregnancy. So there's a paper coming out, um, uh, Sam, Dr. Sam Wasser from U, UW, uh, I work with him on the uh, Orca Scat Project. Um, very fascinating, I can't wait to, to, um, to see this paper. It's in, it's in press, uh, so it's been accepted, um, and it's about uh, the, um, I can't, and I can't give it away, <laughs> but um, it's looking at fecal hormones uh, for pre pregnancy hormones in fecal matter. And the paper will, uh, will knock your socks off as far as how many pregnancies are lost during, uh, so miscarriages. So uh, to, to follow up, uh, those, the, these nine babies that were, well really 10 babies that were born and nine that are currently still living that we know, the, the, uh, there was enough food. Short answer, there was enough food to get them conceived and to, to, to retain the pregnancy and to birth them and, and uh, for the moms to nurse them so far. That said, the next three to five years, um, is scary as hell, scary as hell for this population. Call the White House. <laughs> uh-huh. Mm. Not, no. No, the one time that um, that I know of uh, of an okay, so sorry. The the question was uh, with all, with all these southern resident fish eating babies, is there any danger of the transients attacking and you know going after those? Um, no, they'd be run out of dodge. <laughs> And the one time that I know about was a situation, I don't quote me on the whale, it was either J-17 or 19. Um, there, J pod was uh, uh, essentially got into a, a skirmish that people actually witnessed, ran a group of transients away from an area, and later in that day, one of those two J pod moms came out of a cove with a calf. 
So the, the population was, was running off the, the transients. Generally, when I've been in, the, in, in, a, in a boat and I've seen populations of, you know, like a group of, of T's and a group of residents, as soon as it's of evident that the residents are in the area, the T's hightail it out of there. They just don't stay in the, in the region. It might change now that the popul you know, the, the group size of transients are increasing, but I don't think so. I just think it's personally, I don't think that that's, that's, not, that's not one of the things that we need to be concerned about yet. Uh-huh. Like, okay, so is, is the question, um, do, does the increase in shipping container noise or just noise in the environment, does that impact fish eaters more than mammal eaters? I don't know. I don't know, but that's an interesting question. I'm not an acoustician. It's one of those things that besides going back and getting a degree in geology, which I would love to do if I had another lifetime, studying acoustics would be another thing that I would do. It's just not, it's not, I don't think, intuitively, I don't think so. John, I'm sorry I keep picking on you, but do you have any comment? Yeah, he doesn't know either. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know, but, uh, but um, maybe if you shoot me an email, I'll ask an expert, because we certainly have experts on acoustics, and they would know the answer to that. Mm-hmm. Okay, two good questions. Is there any funding for Tucker next year? Uh, and is there any information on Rhapsody's uh, necropsy? So uh, for those um, of you that don't know, Tucker is a scat detection dog um, that can find killer whale poop. Um, we are uh, actually, uh, the Center for Well Research and Sam, um, we've, we've uh, Ken and Sam met over Christmas. And we are uh, in the process of trying to do a fundraiser on the on San Juan Island, which has never been done before, uh, to jointly fundraise um, for a number of projects, and that's like way top of the list. Uh, that project did not have funding for the last two years, which just slays me, given that we have these nine new babies, uh, and um, just it would have been fantastic to have fecal from, from these moms, um, but say lovey. Uh, and then the other one, uh, Rhapsody. No, I, I spoke with John uh, Raverty, the, um, the vet from Department of Fisheries and Oceans, who's responsible for that. I talked to him, um, I wanna say mid-November, and they had a rash of strandings of large baleen whales up in kind of his, closer to his neck of the woods. And he just said, frankly, that he was inundated and trying to finish that report and that the um, J32 uh, um, necropsy was absolutely next on his list. He, he recognizes that everybody's, you know, biting their nails waiting for that information. So I would say any time now on that. Mm-hmm. Alan? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Alan's asking a, a question about the DTAG study that w went on for four years. So it was a joint project with uh, Cascadia Research Collective, uh, NOAA Fisheries Science Center, and uh, myself, uh, UC Davis at the time. Um, so we essentially uh, put suction cup tags on, uh, on southern residents and then um, followed them until they fell off, essentially. And my own um, master's and, and uh, PhD research were uh, having to do with uh, change in whale behavior, um, 
uh, under a, just a, a variety of different situations. Um, point being, I, I helped develop a piece of equipment that is, you saw um, Fred show a theodolite uh, for some of the work that they do from land. I helped develop a piece of equipment that allows me to take that kind of information, but from a boat, so I can get an offset data point from a whale and a boat and the equipment, the program will tell you how far apart they are, which is pretty fantastic. So essentially we, we coupled, the DTAG study coupled the information that we call it the whale, whale collected data. So speed, pitch, roll, um, essentially what that, what that animal is doing and then also what the, what the acoustic environment around that animal is. And then we coupled that with the information that I was collecting as far as like where physically on the planet that whale was. And then my research partner, Jeff Hogan, collected all of the information on the vessels that were around that whale. Um, sometimes they lasted for an hour, sometimes some of our, I think our, our longest tags were over eight hours. Um, so really, really getting an idea for the first time of what the, what the environment is that the whale itself is, is subjected to given different, uh, say, vessel scenarios. So not only whale watch boats, but private fishing boats, uh, commercial fishing boats, commercial tankers in the area, definitely the prevailing noise uh, out of that data or the deep seas that are in and out of uh, um, Haro Strait. So Juliana Houghton, actually, who spoke earlier, I was surprised to see her presenting on her transient information, which was interesting, but she's the lead author on the paper that Alan was asking about. And essentially the, the, um, the upshot of that paper is that speed is the most important thing with regard to the acoustic environment that those whales are being, being kind of um, uh, the living through. So faster boats, obviously near boats, the boats actually did a pretty good job overall of staying at that 200 uh, yard legal distance, um, but faster speeds definitely um, increase the sound signature in the immediate region of the whale. Um, it, it's obvious that's, that, that speed is the most important thing to get a handle on. How that ends up being used in a policy sort of way, I have no idea. Um, I think that was part of your question. And then the other part is like, what else is gonna come out of the DTAG study? There are um, at least four papers that I know that are in prep uh, that are gonna be information coming out of that. One has to do with, um, you know, we as well um, biologists and researchers, we code for what we think the whales are doing. Are they, are they foraging? Are they resting? Are they traveling? What are they doing? One of the questions that, uh, that will come out of that is when we, think that they're for, when we think that they're traveling, they actually might be foraging. Um, so to get a handle on different behavior states, maybe behavior states that are, that are um, um, biologically important to the animals, that, that we, need to, we need to understand what's happening when, those are, when, when the whales are engaged in different behavior states, that, that question, I'm sorry, I'm kind of roundabout coming to the answer here. Um, we're looking at how we code things with our eye. Does that actually play out with what the whale is actually doing? The D tags are so sophisticated that when you couple this, when you create a 3D map of what the whale is doing underwater when we can't see them, it actually gives, a, it gives an opportunity for the people that are doing that part of the science to actually say what they're doing. So in other words, <laughs> Um, there's a lot of information that those tags are collecting that we're just starting to get a handle on how to, how to, how to pick it apart to, to ask good questions. That's one of them. Another one is going to be trying to get a handle on the deep sea noise. So if you can see one of these deep sea containers, it's deafening. It's so loud in the environment even at distances that where they're just small, not dots on the horizon, but when you can tell that it's a big deep sea, the, the acoustic signature in the water is, is tremendous. And when you think about an area like Haro Strait and the Strait of Georgia, where they're talking about increasing that kind of shipping up, you know, four times maybe of these very, very, very large boats, you know, but, but ship, shipping container ships that are two and three and four sizes, you know, times bigger than what we have right now. Imagine what that's going to do to the, to the acoustic environment that the whales are kind of living in. So there's another study coming out about that. Um, 
kind of spacing. There's there's like five of them that are in prep right now. Again, uh, you have. Um, what I was going to suggest earlier is if people have questions, I'm happy to, uh, if I don't know the answer, uh, I can do a follow-up uh, on our Facebook or on our, on our website or something like that. Like, shoot me an email and I'll put it out there. I'll, I'll find the answer and put it out there. You know, when I was in England, there were two incidences. Actually, Howie and Susan might be better people to answer that question. There, just this last week, there were two situations where there was uh, recordings of fairly significant uh, military, military maneuverings in the inland waters. Yes, it can have absolute uh, impacts to the whales. Um, Ken recorded a number of years ago where there was Navy testing in Haro Strait, and he happened to be on his deck and had a video camera, and he recorded the whales sticking their, their jaws where the sound comes in out of the water and basically like bum rushing the beach, like he was terrified he was going to have a mass stranding. And it was right in, it was in uh, response to, to um, the shoot, the USS shoot doing maneuvers. Um, that's something that, um, as I understand it, the military has been really um, forthcoming with them. No. Okay, so um, they won't say what was happening, but they are saying what wasn't happening. Those are like known knowns and unknown knowns. Uh, yeah, if you follow, uh, it, you have that online on your Facebook page, don't you? There's information on Oregon Network's Facebook page about these about these incidences. It's it's a it's a problem. It's one of the reasons why this you know there's there's people that have strong feelings against the satellite tagged animals. I have feelings about it too, but I, I, I'm a scientist and I, I, I value the information that we're gathering from those tags. One of them is being able to document how many times the animals use uh, areas, especially on the outer coast, that are currently designated as military testing areas. We have to know how often they go there in order to be able to make a valid case that we need to have some protections. Um, also, just being able to document, uh, you know, that the, the use back and forth along along the coast of, uh, of uh, you know, Washington to Monterey, and how many times the tagged animals loop in front of the Columbia River. They're not looping in front of the Columbia River for no reason. They're looping there because that's where they would have gone for food. Um, and so we people that are pushing for the uh, Snake River dams to be removed, we need that information to be able to say this is, this is valuable. And, you know, it doesn't have to go on forever. There's a, there's a finite number of tags that need to be deployed out there, but it's, it's justification, I guess. If it's, if it's going to happen, there are some good things that can come out of it. I'm probably not going to have anybody to drink beer with but <laughs> tonight. <laughs> Um, if we contact the White House, is there a place to go to get information on what to say? Um, that's a great question. Um, and so myself and um, a, a couple friends from the island started an organization called, brace yourselves, Southern Resident Killer Whale Chinook Salmon Initiative. It's a mouthful. It's CSI for short, because it is a crime scene being investigated. Um, there is a tremendous amount of information on that site, so srkwcsi.org, and that, that will tell you everything you need to know. It gives you sound bites for what to say to the, to the White House. Um, it's just a fantastic kind of repository for information on this subject, so please go there. Um, yes, SRKW, so Southern Resident Killer Well, Chinook Salmon Initiative.org.